So now we're going to start with the stories uh, that Im Akram has to share with us. Uh, she's going to tell us how life was in her, uh, in her village, Zib, uh, before the Nakba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jamia. Ana min qariyat Zib qada aqa. Kuna bi falastin baladna wa watanna taba'an. I am from Zib village, district of Akka. Uh, I was living in Palestine, my homeland. We were living there happily and safely in our lands and our properties uh, and most important between our uh, among our families. Uh, <laughs> so next to our village there was a settlement called or named Naharia settlement. So we used to live, we used to live uh, peacefully with the settlers in, uh, in Naharia. We were friends with them. We used to go to seek medication at their settlement. They used to come and work at our village. We had no problems whatsoever. We never expected the settlers from Naharia to do what they did to us. They even used to come, the settlers from Naharia used to come and attend our weddings. Uh, they used to like our weddings and we used to go and visit them. And there were, there were doctors from the settlement used to come to, uh, our, to our village uh, at any time we wanted them to come. I even still remember the names of the doctors that used, uh, we used to deal with. The one of them was uh, Kiwi and the other one was Natan. And there was another doctor her name, uh, was, uh, whose name was uh, Maryam. So we, we, listen, we heard about what happened in Deir Yassin and the massacre that happened in that village, but we never expected something like that to happen to us because we were friends and we were just like one big family with the settlers in Naharia. We used to pass to go to Akka and no one, nobody or nobody from the settlement ever stopped us or made with us any kind of problem, caused us any problem. We used to always pass in front of Naharia settlement because that was the only way to go to Akka. So once there were three trucks transporting uh, vegetable uh, fruits, mainly oranges, from Zeev village into the main cities of Akka and Haif in order to sell them there. Uh, so the, uh, the, a group of settlers from Naharia stopped the three trucks 
وحرقوا الشاحنات. And they burned the trucks and killed the the ten, the ten men that were inside these trucks. في شاحنات تنتين كمان للذيب ومحملين الأشياء ليبيعوها لهن بالطريق سمعوا صوت الرصاص قبل ما يصلوا نهارية. So there were uh, two other trucks following the previous ones heard the uh, the bullet sound and saw the smoke. وشافوا الدخان وقفت الشاحنات سألوا شو في قالوا إنه عباب نهار يا الجيش الإسرائيلي وقف الشاحنات وقتل اللي بقلبه وحرقوا السيارة. So they found out what happened in uh, for the t- uh, three trucks uh, in front of Naharia entrance or in front uh, of Naharia settlement. رجعوا الشاحنات التنتين عطوا خبر للذيب طبعا الذيب كانت يعني كتير متضايقة من هالخبر. ليش من القتل اللي ليش ليش تضايقوا؟ تضايقوا لأن نهار يا ما يوم كنا متوقعين إنه تعمل هيك. So the two trucks returned back to Zeb village and told the families what about what happened to the trucks. So everybody got real really upset because they never expected something like that to ha- to uh, to happen and they never expected something like that from the settlers in Naharia. طبعا البلد عاشت برعب وخافت انه يوم ما يعملوا فينا مجزره او شيء لانه بلشوا بالقتل. So they were, everybody was just terrified and was afraid that a massacre would happen in our village. بعد فتره شيء اسبوع او 10 ايام اجوا على واحد معمر قريب كثير لنهار يا احنا بلدنا عمرت بمنطقه So after a week or so, uh, the settlers from Naharia attacked a house that was from uh, a house from our village, or uh, and that that was close to Naharia. كان الوقت بالليل وأول واحد إجوا عليه أتلو عنده غنم وسيرة غنم وعنده راعي وعايش يعني هناك بالليل. إجوا كسروا الباب وفاتوا قتلوا الرجال والراعي اللي عنده. So they attacked that house. Inside that house there was a, a, a man and his wife and a shepherd who used to work for the family. They attacked that house, uh, killed the shepherd and the, and the man using axes. مين شاف الشوفة مرت الرجال كانت حامل إلى خمس أشهر. تخبت بالدخون من خوفه ما يقتلوه. So the wife saw what happened to her husband and to the shepherd and she was pregnant. Uh, so she went and ha- she had no place uh, to hide but the chimney. So she hid inside uh, there. بقيت متخبي لأن ما عادت اجتمع الصوت لأن بالأول كانوا يقولوا إنه وين مدام هلا كان هون وين مدام تسمعهن وهي متخبيه ضلت متخبيه لانه ما عادش بعد لا دعسي ولا صوت. She she stayed hiding inside the chimney until she she stopped uh, hearing any noise voices and they, she knew that they left. ساعتها المراه طلعت وفاتت بين البساتين وظلت وصلت بلد اسمها الكابري قريب علينا. And when they left, she managed to run away through the woods into uh, another village, which is uh, another village close to us, which is Cabri village. The settlers started to move from one village into another, and that woman started to uh, run away with the villagers from each place she used to go to until she finally reached Lebanon. The settlers started to move from one house into another in our village, uh, killing the people. And so everybody knew what was happening and started to run into the center of the village. طبعا يهربوا البيوت على طرف مش بالبلد القديم يهربوا على البلد القديم صاروا ينادوا انه لازم العالم تهرب لانه ما في مقاومه قوم اليهود
So there was no, the people were too weak to, uh, to resist the, or to protect their village, so they had no choice but to run away. أكثر العالم طلعت بالبحر إحنا بلدنا لأنه في البحر لففة لف فيك عليها. Most of the people ran away uh, through the sea using their fishing boats because our village was located on the seashore. وأكثر الشباب كانوا صيادة سمك فلوكة كتير صاروا اللي يهرب بروح البحر يحطوا بالفلوكة ووصلوا. And most of the men inside our village were fishing uh, fishers, so or fishermen. So they used their uh, fishing boats to put people there and transport them into Lebanon. Some people walked to reach the Lebanese borders. Others used their cars. And from uh, when they, after reaching the borders, they went into uh, Sur, into Tyre. So Imam Akram uh, told us how was life in, uh, in Zib village and how was it like to, uh, to live in Palestine before the Nakba and before, and uh, before, uh, the Nakba and before the people were exiled from Palestine. But now we have to know what is actually a Nakba. First of all, you have to know that the word Nakba means, uh, is the word catastrophe in Arabic. So why the Palestinians call this a Nakba or what happened to them during that year, during 1948 to call it, call it a Nakba? We have to like go back in time a little bit uh, to uh, the 1900s. The 1900s uh, witnessed the uh, establishment of, or the rise of what we now know as the Zionist movement. The Zionists, I'm going to just talk about this briefly, but in a very simplified way, the Zionists uh, decided, or they wanted to, um, they wanted to uh, uh, help the Jews who were in Europe under persecution to find a solution for, the, for these Jews. So they decided to establish a state, a Jewish state for them uh, in order to let them run away or leave uh, Europe. So they decided that the best place to establish this state is Palestine. And uh, the, the Jewish immigration movement started back at that time into Palestine. And this explains why we had Jewish settlements in Palestine before the year 1948. So, they started, the Jews started to go to Palestine. The Palestinians were okay with that. They, they felt, because you know, the Palestinians were welcoming for the Jews because they knew that they were under persecution in Europe. They were, went uh, through many hardships in Europe and they were okay with that. Uh, and you know, in Palestine, people did not differentiate between any religion. Christians, Muslims, Jews were all living together, loving each other. They had no problem with that. And the biggest proof for that is what Imakram was telling us uh, in her story. So how did they actually do it? Okay. The, the Jews managed to go to Palestine, to immigrate, to settle in Palestine. But how did they establish the state of Israel? I'm going to start with this quote. It says, Arabs throughout country induced to believe wild tales of Irgun butchery were seized with limitless panic and started to flee for their lives. This mass flight soon developed into a maddened, uncontrollable stampede. The political and economic significance of this development can hardly be overestimated. This is, uh, this quote is from the book of Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin is known to be the sixth prime minister of Israeli state. And he's also known to be the head of Irgun gang. Irgun gang was one of various gangs that had, uh, that its main objective was to kill Palestinians, to massacre Palestinians in order to force them to leave Palestine. And here he was discussing the importance of Deryasin massacre because 
what they did in Dar Yassin, Dar Yassin was a village located next to Al Quds, Jerusalem. So they wanted to, ex they wanted uh, the Zionists wanted to expand their occupation of that city of Jerusalem. So they wanted to get rid of as much villages there as much as possible. So they entered uh, and they mainly used Zionist gangs in order to uh, do that. These gangs, Ergun and Hagana, went into this, uh, attacked th this village, um, Deir Yassin village. They killed more than 279 people, villagers inside Palestine. They were all unarmed. They had no weapons because mainly the Palestinians were under the, the control of the British mandate and they were not allowed to own any kind of weapons. Because, you know, even if a Palestinian was accused of having or holding a, a knife, he would go to jail, to British jail, for like six months. So they had no weapons with them. They entered, uh, they entered that village and they started to kill people in a very brutal way so that they scared them. And they allowed only a couple of people to leave this village so that these people go from village into another and tell the, peop the Palestinians and what, what is happening. And that, like that, they spread the fear in the hearts of, of people or, or Palestinians. And that's how they used fear factor in order to force Palestinians to leave Palestine. So I'm going to move to another uh, uh, quote. This quote is from Dr. Alfred Engel. He used to work for the Red Shield of David, which is a medical organization, Jewish medical organization. He said, we got into the village easily. There were only dissidents of Ergun and Haganah members there, and they were putting bodies on trucks. In the houses, there were dead in all about a hundred men, women, and children. It was terrible. It was clear that they, the attackers, had gone from house to house and shot the people at close range. I was a doctor in the German army for five years in World War I, but I had not seen such a horrifying scene. So... That's how the, the, mainly the, Israel, the Zionists managed to establish that state on the blood and the body of the Palestinian people in Palestine. So then, uh, by 1948, or by the end of 1948, we had more than uh, 750,000 Palestinian refugees spread out in all the neighboring countries of Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And we had, uh, you know, the, the world started to witness uh, a refugee crisis. So what were, the, what were they supposed to do with this, this number of, of refugees? So they were discussing the Israeli government. Now, by now, we had the Israeli government establishing or announcing other uh, states. So they were discussing what to do with these refugees. Do we allow them to go back to Palestine after, or to what they call Israel, after the, the war finishes? And they decided not to let them go back because if they allow the Palestinians to go back to Palestine, they will, ha they will no longer have a Jewish majority, which means, you know, how, how were they supposed to uh, establish a Jewish state with no Jewish majority, with Palestinian majority. So it's not going to happen. It's like Israel is committing suicide. And that's what actually uh, the, the, the Israeli ambassador uh, to, you, to the United States said when he was asked why you don't allow the if Palestinians to go back to Palestine. So he said, uh, his name is Elias ya Eliyahu. He said that if Israel allowed the Palestinians to go, the refugees to go back to Palestine, it's like Israel is actually committing suicide. So, and this, uh, here we have another a quote from the memorandum by Yosef Witz to Ben-Gurion. He was telling him or giving him, him recommendations on how to not allow the Palestinians to go back to Palestine and, and on how to expel more Palestinians. And the first advice was to, or the destruction of villages as much as possible during military operations. And the fifth uh, advice to him was propaganda, which is we're going back to Deir Yassin, how they used propaganda to spread fear 
and uh, in the hearts of all the Palestinians so that they expel Palestinians uh, as much as they can. And, yeah. So I'm going to end with this uh, map of Palestine before the, the year 1948. So this is Zeb Village, as you can see, so that you can relate to the story of Am Akram. This is Zeb Village. And right here we have Naharia settlement. As you can see, they're so close to each other. Uh, and this is the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, and this, uh, which is the sea that the, Pal the Palestinians used to go into Palestine. This is the Leban uh, into Lebanon, excuse me. And this is the Lebanese border too. And now we can go back to um, Akram's story. She's gonna tell us how is it like to live inside a tent uh, after the Nakba. When we got أول مدينة بلبنان قريبة علينا صور طبعا ما في إن مطرح نلجئ في العالم سكنت المدارس الكنائس الجوامع ناس بالطرقات الصليب الأحمر ساعد العالم يعني يجيب حرمات يجيب أكل للأطفال. So when the people first arrived to Tyre, to, uh, to Sur and Lebanon, they had no place to go to, they had no shelter. So the people basically stayed in mosques, in churches, in schools, and some people just stayed on, on the streets. كثرة كثير المهجرين بالصور يعني كل الضيع اللي so the number of refugees started to increase by day and all the, the villages that were close to us, to Zeb village, started to come into Lebanon. So because the numbers started to increase, they established for us Ayn uh, al refugee camp in another city, which is Saida. كائن الأرض مزروعة أمح وطراب وحالة يعني كتير مش مريحة أبدا. So uh, the 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 land that they established or set up the tents for us on was previously planted with wheat and it was still mud. So they just put the tents over that land. قد ما في مهجرين صاروا يحطوا كل عيلتين بخيمة. And because the number of the refugees was so big, as I said, every two families had to share one tent. So uh, the, we had no electricity, power, no, no uh, water, no, uh, no running water, we had no bathrooms. المي طبعا بالدور يعني عملوا خزانات والحنفياتك تروح الوحدة ساعات تقعد ساعة لا تقدر تعبي مي. So we had big storages, we had big water storages, and we had to go and wait and turn in order to get like some, uh, some, uh, some uh, water. We had like to wait for an hour sometimes in order to get some water. والحمامات كانت شركة طبعاً بعيدة شوي عن المخيم. The bathrooms were shared and they were far away from the camp. صعب بالليل خاصة اللي عند أولاد يعني صعب كانت كتير. It was so hard for us to go like to wait and turn for to use a bathroom and it was especially hard at night because uh, if you have if you had kids back then to go and get them into the bathroom. At night. بلشت العالم يعني الشباب يشتغلوا بالبساتين. طبعا من مأساة المخيمات في مخيم بطرابلس وفي مرة عندها ثلاث أطفال. So one of the stories that I still remember about uh, the suffering of living inside these tents was a story is a story of a woman who used to live in a camp in Tripoli, north to Lebanon. She had three baby kids. راحت تعبي مي طبعا ما هو بالدور تتأخر شوي عالت الأكل على البابور الكاز وتأخرت لإجت. So she was she she was cooking. She put her uh, the food on uh, the burner inside the tent and went to get some water. فار الأكل على البابور هب البابور الكاز هبت النار إجت بالخيمة حرقت الخيمة صار ينزل. 
شقف هيك مولعة بالنار نزلت على طبعا على الأولاد احترقوا While she was gone, uh, while, while she, the mother was gone, uh, the, the food started to boil over the burner and it spilled over the burner. So uh, the, the tent caught fire from the, uh, from the burner and the whole tent just uh, uh, got fire. The, uh, and the, the three kids were still inside. حاولوا الجيران والناس الموجودين بالمخيم ما قدروا يطفوها للخيمة. The neighbors tried to uh, stop the fire but they couldn't because it was mainly made of fab fabric and combustible materials. اجت الام شافت الخيمة مولعة اولادها عم يحترقوا يعني كانت مأساة كثير كبيرة على الام لأنه شافت اولادها عم يحترقوا. So the mother came and she just came running and she just saw her three baby kids burned uh, till death. She started to scream and yell until she fainted. And she stayed, uh, she had the same condition. Every time she remembered how she saw her three babies burned, uh, she would start screaming and yelling until she faints. So the neighbors suggested to her husband that maybe they would change the place of their living so that she forgets or stop remembering. She had brothers in Ain al Hilwe refugee camp. They went and got their sister and made up for uh, made for her a small tent next to theirs so that she can live there. برضو ما نسيت كل ما تتخيل إنه كيف أول نظرة شفت إن في عم بيحترقوا الأولاد كمان بعين الحلو تصير تصرخ وتغيب عن الوقت. But she never forgot. But she never forgot because, uh, like every time she used to remember how her how she saw her kids just three bodies burned, she would start screaming and yelling until fainting. ضلت على الحالة لحتى توفت. And she stayed in the same condition until she finally passed away. ومن بأسات المخيمات عين الحلو كمان. كل يوم والثاني ثلاث أربعة أيام حسب مزاجهن اليهود. أي أي سنة يعني غرات هاهم يعني مش تقيل كتير إن على زعم إن إنه يضرب المحلات للفدائية بين البساتين على طرف المخيم هيك شيء. So during 1972, the Israeli aircrafts used to uh, bomb and shell some sites in, inside the camps, and they used to claim that these sites were for the Palestinian fighters. But once there was, uh, they started uh, attacking or uh, bombing and shelling the camp very uh, strongly, uh, and it was like in a continuous manner. They they just continued on uh, bombing and uh, throwing rocks. هاي الغارة كانت كتير قوية وقتلت ناس كتير وهدمت البيوت لأن البيوت طبعا مش قوية خيام واللي بدي وسع حاله شوي كان عامل بيت من تنك وإشي هذا كله and during that day, many people were killed, and uh, there were many uh, that caused ma uh, big damage for the camp because you know the houses were not strong. There were still many camps and uh, many metallic houses. Uh, so the people had, people had no place to hide but the mosque of the camp because it was the only place made up of cement in the camp. So 
So we wanted to run away, me, my mother, and my father, my whole family wanted to go and hide inside the camp. And the moment we, uh, when we went out uh, to, to the to outside, like left uh, the place we were living, we saw the most horrifying scene ever, just people all around running, screaming and yelling, women and kids laying down on the streets, killed or injured. شوفنا عطري ما طلعنا على الشارع العام اللي بتمشي فيه السيارات وإذ مرة ميتة نايمة بالطريق جا ليقيمة الإسعاف بسك هيك من إيده ليشيلة إلا الإيد طلعت عنده كله لقينا الشظية جايتها على كتفها من هون قصصته so one of the scenes that I cannot forget was of a woman laying down on the street and came a man that wanted to help her so he, gra uh, he grabbed her hand uh, to try to like make her uh, stand so he grabbed her hand and the moment he grabbed her hand her hand was ripped off in his hand and it turned out that she was killed already so my father was an old man and he could not bear to see that scene and to see the people just running around and the amount of blood he saw. من بيتنا للجامع طبعا مشوار شوية يعني هاي الشوفات اللي شفناها على الطريق أبوي كتير الدايق وتعب لما وصلنا الجامع تعبان قال لي ندخلكوا ودونا على مستشفى بس يكون لأني أنا كتير تعبان يكون لا في جرحة ولا في قتلة لأني ما عاد أقدر أتحمل أشوف جريح ولا أتي When we reached the mosque, my father asked us to take him to the hospital because he was feeling really tired. But he asked us not to take him to a hospital that has a, that had any injured or killed people because he was not able to see more blood. أخذنا على مستشفى بالصيدا مستشفى فؤاد عسيران. لما الحكيم كشف عليه وشافه هو لا مجروح ولا شيء بس تعبان. قال صار عنده هبوط قلب في صدمة قوية كتير عملت معه يعني هالإشكال. We took him to a hospital in Saida, and when the when the doctors saw him or uh, treat, he was trying to treat him, he said that uh, he, my father, had uh, a, a heart attack because of a, a big shock because of what he saw. بعد ساعتين من وصلت على المستشفى توفى. بهبوط أنطانا الدكتور تقرير إنه صاير عنده هبوط بالقلب. So my uh, the doctor tried try to treat him, but he he failed, and my father only survived for two hours after that, and then he passed away. طبعا لما العالم صار وقت مهجرة وإيش بعد فترة من هذا الوقت. في واحد بده شغيل رحنا أنا وأبو أكرم منطقة بقولوا للمنتوفيرد فوق بيروت منطقة بيت ميري. So the people in the camps uh, were taking humanitarian aids from the United Nations from many NGOs, but that was not enough for them for their living. So they had to find some kind of jobs or anything in order to earn their living. My husband, Abu Akram, found uh, a job at a wealthy man's house as a gardener. So we left the camp and we went to uh, live in that man's house so that we, my husband guards his house and t uh, looks after his garden. Usually Abu Akram used to go to, to downtown of Beirut in order to pray. To pray. شاف بالسوق بردقان كتير منظر عجبه ولاه نمناحة مشترى شوي وجاب نعلم So once when, when after finishing praying he uh, passed by the grocery store and he found some nice look, good looking oranges so he got some and went back home بعد شوي اجا عنا ضيوفنا جير من جيراننا واجا عنا ناس من سكان بيروت أصحابنا 
After when Abu Akram uh, arrived home, we had some visitors. Some of his friends came over uh, from Beirut. قمت أنا حطيت شوية ليمون وضيفت الضيوف اللي عنا وبيجيم لي أبو أكرم قام حبة وأشرة وعد يأكل فيها. So I, when they arrived, I wanted to serve them something. So I just got the oranges, chopped up some of the, them, and uh, served the guests. And while everybody was just talking and laughing, so Abu Akram uh, ate some of these oranges. وهو عم يأكل الليمونة صار يبكي. And when Abu Akram ate from that orange, uh, from these oranges, he started to cry. So the, the visitors or his friends were like, Abu Akram, you just were you were talking to us and laughing with us. What happened to you? Why are you crying? So he said, this orange reminded me of Palestine. لأن هالليمونة هاي مش من لبنان هاي من ليمون فلسطين. So he and he said, this orange is not from Lebanon. This orange is from Palestine. كيف من الشجاب ليمون فلسطين على لبنان؟ هذا ليمون لبنان وكل الليمون قال لا ولا بتنعوني صار يقولوا له. So so they asked him, how could the Palestinian oranges go and uh, come into Lebanon? So he said, you cannot, you cannot, you can say whatever you want, but these oranges are from Palestine. So انت مجدود شجاب ليمون فلسطين على لبنان وصاروا يضحكوا هذا اللي ما تقنعوني هل ليمون هذا ليمون فلسطين أو من ليمون الزيب بالذات أو من ليمون ياف. So these were they were like you man are out of your mind you're just mad. These uh, these Palestinian oranges can never make it into Palestine because it's not allowed for Palestinian oranges to come into Palestine. So he said, you can say whatever you want. You can make uh, fun of me. You can say that I'm mad. I'm nuts. But these oranges, I am sure that they are from Palestine and not from Lebanon. <laughs> قاموا من الصبح الصحف ببيروت وضجة وقامي محتاجين لبنانية إنه ليمون لنا كيف إجا العين طبع البيت مش هيك قولي لنا كيف إجا البيت ما هي بدي أحكيها أنا أنت بلشت بالحكي عن الجريبة أحكي لنا آه. ما إجا تاني يوم بعدها آه. شو حامل بإيده حامل بإيده جريدة أنت أيوة. ما صبرتيش علي <تصفيق> تستحكيها آه. هيك لهو جاي إنه من الصبح بكير so the very next day, after, of course, they left, the very next day in the morning, one of the, uh, his friends came knocking on our door, holding a newspaper. So he said, yesterday we made fun of you, but today it turned out that you were right. And it was all over the newspapers uh, saying that a big amount of oranges came from the occupied territories for, uh, into, in, made, up into, uh, made their way into Lebanon. So it was true that these oranges are actually Palestinian oranges and not Palestinian uh, and not Lebanese oranges. So he said, but I just want to know how were you able to recognize that these oranges are from Palestine and not Lebanese? So he said, so Abu Akram said, I was able to know because of its taste, of its smell, of how it looks. قال له بعدك مش ناسة ولو من أي سنة إحنا من تعاون الثمانة وأربعين كان وقت سنة الثنين وسبعين. So he said he told him he his friend said so you want to convince me that after all these years you left Palestine in 1948 and now we're in 1972 and you did not forget the taste of the of the Palestinian oranges. قال له هالسنين كلها ومش ناسة طعمة. قال له كيف بدي أنساها ورخلقت بفلسطين وربينا بقيرنا وليمونا ورزقنا 
ما بنساها وفلسطين لو منعيش مئة سنة ما راح ننساها فلسطين بلدنا فلسطين صاري حكيك So Abu Akram said, I was born in Palestine, I was raised in Palestine, I know everything about Palestine, I would never forget Palestine. So how would I forget the oranges from Palestine? Abu Akram says thank you for listening to her stories. So now, uh, you know, uh, how was it like to live in Palestine before the Nakba? You know, what is the Nakba and what happened and how they established, the Zionists established their state. But now what you have to do to know, you know, Im Akram was, or was born in Palestine and she knows Palestine. And that's why she wants to return back to Palestine. But what about the Palestinians, like me, the refugees who never saw Palestine? Why do they want to go back to Palestine? Why do they still want to go back to Palestine after all these years? You know, I'm 22 years old. I'm, I was born and raised in a refugee camp. I've never seen Palestine because I'm not allowed to go there. And all the refugees in Lebanon are this, just the same. Not only in Lebanon, and all the Arab states are not allowed to go back to Palestine. We are the third generation after the Nakba and we still want to go back to Palestine so why is that so first of all I usually start with this small sto a short story this is my friend Brahim uh, Brahim is 18 years old uh, and uh, this is how I left Brahim before coming to the United States but uh, three days after arriving to the United States I found this photo of Brahim so I talked to my parents and I asked them, mom and dad, what happened to Ibrahim? So they told me, you have to know that Ibrahim uh, was, had not, didn't have the opportunity to continue his education and he never had the chance to get a job. So he went to his mom and dad and he said, his parents, and he said, we want, or he wanted to travel to Europe. Uh, they were afraid that he might drown in the ocean just like other refugees. So they said, no, you, ha you cannot go. So Ibrahim uh, just lost hope and he had nothing else but to apparently to shoot himself, kill himself. Uh, and that's what, so what is actually happening in these camps so that someone 18 years old loses hope? So. Uh, can, I'm going to start with this uh, statistics about the Palestinian refugees. So we, you guys have to know we have Palestinian refugees in, all around Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. We had Palestinian refugees in Iraq. And we also have Palestinian refugees in the West Bank and in Gaza Strip. But today I'm going to tell you about the conditions of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon mainly for two reasons. The first one is because the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon have the worst conditions among all other refugees in all the, uh, the Arab states and they even have worse, ref uh, worse conditions than the Palestinian refugees in Gaza Strip. And because I live in Lebanon and I know more about uh, what is happening there. So, first thing, this is a photo for Burj al Barajni refugee camp. This is where I live. Burj al Barajna refugee camp was established in 1948. Was established in 1948 on an area of one third mile square. So it's 900 meters square. And uh, so it was, so it's basically two very small area. And it was established in 1948 to, uh, to contain around 10,000 Palestinian refugees. Now in 2016, we have 25,000 Palestinians living in Burj al Barajna refugee camp. And after the Syrian crisis, we have to share this area with another 25,000 Syrian refugees, which makes it 50,000 refugees living in Burj al Barajna refugee camp. We also have uh, another camp, and uh, this camp is located in Beirut, in capital of Lebanon. And we also have three more camps in Beirut, Sabra and Shatila and Mar Elias camps. 
uh, then this is a photo for عين الحلوة Refugee Camp. عين الحلوة Refugee Camp is where Im Akram lives. It was, as you now know, uh, established in 1948. And as you can see, we have uh, Lebanese army checkpoints on the entrance of Ain al Hilwi refugee camp. We basically have, or we actually have, Lebanese army checkpoints on uh, all the entrances of all the camps all around Lebanon. I'm going to explain this during the uh, presentation. And this is another photo for Ain al Hilwi refugee camp. So, Ain al Hilwi refugee camp, the area of Ain al Hilwi refugee camp is one mile square. And it has 80,000 Palestinian refugees. And after the Syrian crisis, we estimated the number of refugees inside the camp as 100,000 refugees living on this area. And because Ain al Hilwi refugee camp is the largest camp in, refugee camp in Lebanon, we tend to call it the, the capital of diaspora. Yeah. So, uh, so as you now know, the Palestinians, even after they were exiled, even after all the atrocities that happened to them during 1948, even after they were expelled or forced to leave Palestine, they were never safe from the Israelis. The Israelis always wanted to get rid of the Palestinian, uh, they wanted to get rid of the Palestinian refugees as well. So the photo you can see here right in front of you is to what we used to know as a Nabatiya refugee camp. Nabatiya refugee camp was established in 1948 and was demolished by Israeli aircrafts in 1974. It was completely demolished, destroyed, and big number of refugees was killed during that time. And then we have, this is not it, we ha also have during uh, the invasion, the Israeli invasion of Beirut. Israel basically invaded Beirut because they wanted to get rid of the Palestinian refugees, they wanted to get rid of the Palestinian existence. So they invaded Beirut and this photo you, photo you see right in front of you is for Ain al Hilwi refugee camp during 1982. Now, Ain al Hilwi refugee camp was completely destroyed during that time. And we have another, uh, another refugee camp which was, which was also completely destroyed during that very same year, which is Rashidi refugee camp. But unfortunately, I don't have a photo for Rashidi camp during that time. But both were destroyed as well as other, like all the refugee camps were uh, targeted by the Israeli aircrafts and this is not it. We also have what we know as Sabra and Shatila massacre. So now some people would come and say that Sabra and Shatila massacre was not the fault of the Israeli uh, forces but this is false because what happened in 1982 uh, there was as I said the Israelis wanted to get rid of the Palestinians in Lebanon. So there was a compromise between the Palestinians, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and uh, the Israeli forces or the Israeli government and stated that the Palestinian fighters would leave Lebanon and in return the Israelis would leave Lebanon and the US government would guarantee the safety of the civilians in Sabra and Shatila camps. And this is how the U.S. government guaranteed the safety of the people, the civilians in Sabra and Shatila camps. So basically what happened, the Israeli forces after the PLO fighters, the Palestinian fighters, left Lebanon the same night the Israeli forces went to Sabra and Shatila camps, two camps in the capital of Beirut, uh, Lebanon, Beirut. They went, they they blocked the, camp, the two camps. They did not allow anybody to go to leave the, the two camps. And they did not allow anybody to go into the camps but a group of militias who entered the camp on, the, on September 19, 1982. They entered the camp and they started to kill people inside the camps. Basically, we had, we, there were no fighters. There were only kids, women, all people, all of them were civilians. And they started to kill people for, for 48 continuous hours. And no one was allowed to go into the camps. And no one would actually knew what was happening inside the camp but the Israeli forces. 
and the militias who were actually doing or uh, massacring people inside the camp. And by the end of the 48, uh, 48 hours, we had more than 1,500 Palestinians butchered in Sabra and Shatila camps. Okay, so now you know what happened to the Palestinians uh, because of the Israeli forces. In, in Lebanon and in Palestine. Now, you have to know how the Palestinians are living in Lebanon. So first thing, thing you have to know is that in Lebanon, precisely, we have two types of refugees, of Palestinian refugees. We have the undocumented Palestinian refugees. These, pal these refugees do not enjoy the right of legal residence. In other words, they are not uh, recognized by the, by the Lebanese government. In other words, they do not exist which means that they do not have any ID, they cannot, move if, they cannot move freely in Lebanon, and they don't have a travel document, so they cannot leave Lebanon, and uh, they cannot get married, because if they got married, they would inherit the same conditions and status to their children, and nobody wants that to his children, so they don't get married. And then we have the registered Palestinian refugees. I am a, pal a registered Palestinian refugee. I have an ID that says I am a political Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. And I have a travel document. I don't, I don't have a passport. I have a travel document which does not quite allow me to travel. So it's like you know, when, when I want to, when I am filling any kind of application, I don't know who I am, <laughs> you know? I can't tell because I am not Lebanese and I am not Palestinian to the, the standards, to the international standards because I'm not living in Palestine. I don't hold a passport or nationality that say I am from Palestine. So I'm simply stateless. I don't have any kind of status. So. So in Lebanon, you have to know that in Le Le the Lebanese government poses many institutional and legal barriers on the Palestinians in Lebanon. They treat them as, or they treat us as refugees. After 68 years, they still, the, gov the Lebanese government still uh, treat the Palestinians as refugees. And uh, so treating them as refugees, what does it mean? It means that they're not allowed to work. The Palestinians in Lebanon are not allowed to work. They're not allowed to work in 72 professions. They're not allowed to be engineers. They're not allowed to be doctors, pharmacists, nurses, uh, lawyers. They're not allowed even to be taxi drivers. The only thing that they're allowed to work in is or as gardeners or construction workers. And they treat them, as, uh, they treat them or us as are they put us under a special category of foreigners, which means Palestinian and Lebanon, uh, you know, they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to have social security. They're not allowed to be part of any trade union or syndicates. And in 2001, the Lebanese government issued uh, what we know the ownership law. This law states that a Palestinian refugee is not allowed to own his own property outside the camp. And if a Palestinian refugee already owned any kind of real estate or property outside the camp before the issuance of this law, after his death, this property goes to the Lebanese government and not to his family members. And that's why we are under a special category of foreigners because you guys can go to uh, Lebanon and buy whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, but Palestinian refugees cannot. So uh, they are foreigners, but they, we are special. So you gotta be jealous. And then, we, no. <laughs> and then we are uh, stateless, as I uh, already explained. But then, after several years, the the Lebanese government just remembered that they have Palestinians there and they, they got to do something about it, something new about it. So what they did is that they issued a new law. This new law stated that it was restriction on building materials. So that's why we had uh, the Lebanese army checkpoints on the entrances of the camp because no more uh, building materials were allowed into the camp. 
so that they stop the Palestinians from building inside the camp. So basically, a Palestinian is not allowed to build inside the camp in Lebanon. He's not allowed to own a property outside the camp or own a house outside the camp. He's not allowed to work. He's not allowed to go to public schools. He's not allowed to go to public hospitals. He's not allowed to have any social security. He's not, he is a Palestinian refugee, is deprived of, uh, from all his basic human and civil rights. So why the, the question here is why the Lebanese government is doing this to the Palestinians. It's an Arab state and the Palestinians are Arabs. So why are they doing that? Simply because the Lebanese government is afraid. Afraid of what? It is afraid of that if they showed the Western governments and if they showed the international community that they are okay with the Palestinian presence in Lebanon. They are comfortable with the Palestinian, Palestinian presence and existence in Lebanon. They would, the Western governments, and you know, everybody wants to get rid of the Palestinian refugee crisis. It's been there for 68 years. They want to get rid of it. And one of the solutions that they have in mind is to just resettle the Palestinians in the countries that they are in. But the Lebanese government does not want that. None of the Arab state want, states want that. They don't want to, uh, to, to, to keep the Palestinians in Lebanon. So they're afraid that if they showed the international community that they are okay with the Palestinians, they would have to say like, okay, you're okay, you're doing both. The Palestinians are, uh, you can both, all of you just live in, Pal in Lebanon. So why don't you just give them the, Pal the Lebanese uh, citizenship? And like that, we no longer have any more refugees. And the Lebanese do not want that. And the Palestinians themselves do not want that. Why? because we already have a solution. We already have a legal solution that is recognized by the international law and by all the human rights, which is what we know as the 194 resolution, the right of return. So basically, the Palestinians have what their right recognized by all uh, international laws, which is the right to return. They, that's the only solution that the Palestinians want. They don't want to be resettled in any state. They don't want to immigrate to any Western state. They want to go back to Palestine and not to Palestine as they uh, identify as the West Bank and Gaza. We want to go back to Haifa, to Yaffa, to Akka, to, our, to the houses that we still own the deeds of them. We still have our deeds for these houses and we want to go back there. It's so legally, we can't, we can't go back because we still have our deeds with us and we, we have the law with us, so, and it's our right. So that's the only thing that the Palestinians find as a solution for their crisis, and that's why the Palestinians still want to live inside these camps. And the last point that I'm going to end with is even if the Palestinians had better human conditions or humanitarian conditions in the camps, it does not mean that they don't want anymore to go back to Palestine. In other words, the Palestinians in Syria and in Jordan have much more uh, better conditions than us, but they still want to go back to Palestine. So having, better, uh, having their civil rights does not mean they do not want to go back to Palestine. So the only solution for the Palestinian refugee crisis, you know, now the, this, we have many wars all around the world. We have now many refugees. We have Iraqi refugees, Syrian refugees, Yemeni refugees. And all these refugees, when they go to any country, to any other country, the government of that country, like the, the Syrians, when they go to Canada, they tell them that you can go back. You are now refugees in Canada, but you can go back. You have the right to return to Syria whenever you want. Any refugee have the right to return to his own country. So why the Palestinians are ex excluded from even this right? So the Palestinians only want to return back to Palestine. They only want their legal right of return. And thank you.